RNA polymerase 3 transcription in eukaryotes remains underappreciated. In this video, I will simplify the process by discussing the three fundamental steps. RNA polymerase 3 is responsible for transcribing short non-protein coding genes, such as transfer RNAs, small nuclear RNAs like U6, which is used in splicing, 5S ribosomal RNA, and other short nuclear RNAs. They are often less than 400 nucleotides in length. This is quite different from RNA polymerase 2, which deals with longer mRNAs and non-coding RNAs, and RNA polymerase 1 responsible for transcribing a long ribosomal RNA gene. Structurally, all three polymerases are similar, with some specific subunit variations. To keep it simple, let's focus on the initiation step, where the differences become more apparent. RNA polymerase 3 relies on three main transcription factors, A, B, and C. TF3A is crucial for recognizing the promoter of the 5S ribosomal RNA gene. The primary role of TF3B is to recruit RNA polymerase 3, and it comes in two fundamental forms, containing BRF1 and BRF2, and it changes depending on the context. We will get into their details in a short moment. It has TBP as well, which you have seen in RNA polymerase 2 and 1 transcription. Finally, TF3C, which plays an important role in recognizing promoters in genes other than 5S ribosomal RNA gene. TF3B can sometimes also recognize promoters since TBP is present in this factor. I have videos on RNA polymerase 2 and RNA polymerase 1 transcription, and you can find the links in the description if you would like to explore these topics further. Let's dive deeper into the initiation steps of RNA polymerase 3 transcription. To understand initiation, we need to examine the promoter structure in genes dependent on POL3. POL3 promoters are a bit peculiar because they're often located internally within the transcribed region. It is important to note that this internal feature is a general rule, but it also has exceptions. Broadly, POL3 promoters can be categorized into three types. Class 1 is specific to ribosomal RNA and is an internal promoter. Class 2 includes most transfer RNAs, signs, 7SL, and many viral RNAs. Class 2 promoters are also internal. In contrast, class 3 comprises U6 nuclear RNA, 7SK, RPR1, and selenocysteine transfer RNAs. But these promoters are an exception because they are external and closely resemble typical POL2 promoters. Let's take a closer look at what it means for a promoter to be internal. Imagine this arrow represents the plus one site or the transcriptional start site. Class one promoters consists of two short boxes, box A and box C, positioned just downstream of the plus one site. Box A is typically found around position 50 to 60, while box C resides at position 80 to 90. In between them, there's often an intermediate element at approximately plus 67 to plus 72. The entire promoter region is quite compact, spanning only about 30 bases, and is known as the internal control region. Class 2 promoters are structurally similar to class 1. They feature box A and box B, but those boxes are closer to the plus 1 position, resulting in a slightly larger span for the entire region. As a side note, in plants and yeast tRNA genes, you can sometimes find a Tara box. However, for some reason, mammals have eliminated Tara boxes in their tRNA genes. Class 3 promoters, unlike the first two classes, are external. The promoter elements are not downstream of the plus 1, but rather upstream. They consist of a Tara box at position negative 30, a proximal sequence element spanning from negative 50 to negative 60, and occasionally a distal sequence element situated further away. The arrangement of class 3 promoters closely resembles that of Paul 2 promoters. We have three classes of promoters. Therefore, each promoter has its own special way of initiating transcription. For class 1 promoters, the process begins with TF3A, recognizing the box A and box C. TF3A is specific to ribosomal RNA. Factor A then recruits TF3B, with the recruitment depending on the BRF1 subunit of the factor B. Once TF3B is in place, RNA polymerase 3 is loaded at the start site and this complex then can open the promoter, allowing it to move into the elongation phase. Class 2 initiation is similar, but instead, TF3C binds the promoter boxes. Factor C 
also then recruits TF3B to the promoter. But instead, this recruitment is through the BRF2 subunit. Again, RNA polymerase 3 is then loaded, leading to the promoter melting and the continuation of transcription. Class 3 promoters are recognized by the Tara binding unit of the TF3B. Usually, it comes with the BRF2 version. The proximal sequence element is occupied by a multi subunit complex called SNAP C, which acts as a helper or activator. If distal sequences are present, OCT1 and STAFs assist in the speedy assembly of SNAP C, facilitating in a faster loading of POL3. This assembly resembles the POL2 mechanism, but with fewer factors involved. Once assembled, this complex opens the promoter for the next steps. Now let's discuss elongation. Class 3 promoters immediately move into elongation if everything is set up in arrangement, making the elongation process less complex for this promoter class. However, there's a small catch for the internal class promoters. Both class 1 and class 2 have factor A or C in front of the polymerase, creating a roadblock that must be cleared for movement. Factor 3B is common to all promoters, and it can be either with BRF1 or BRF2 version. Therefore, factor B doesn't seem to be a major hindrance, also because the elongation complex consists of both TF3B and RNA polymerase 3. Once the roadblock is cleared, the polymerase and TF3B can translocate and initiate RNA synthesis. Sometimes BRF1 and BRF2 may dissociate after a while, suggesting that a complete factor B might not play a significant role in elongation. Regarding the elongation mechanism at a structural level, it is similar to what we have discussed in polymerase 2, but with fewer regulators involved. Transcripts are often short, so polymerase 3 doesn't spend much time on the DNA per transcription cycle. This possibly may explain the reduced need for regulators. And this concludes our discussion on elongation. Now let's move on to termination. Unlike polymerase 2 transcription, Termination in Paul 3 transcription is quite straightforward. It primarily hinges on a short stretch of adenines on the template DNA. In humans, you need only four consecutive adenines, while yeast may require a slightly longer stretch. Termination starts with the adenine stretch, which is converted into uracil on the RNA, creating a A and U hybrid at the polymerase active site. This hybrid serves as the termination signal for polymerase because Paul 3 is sensitive to these A and U hybrids. This sensitivity makes sense because AU hybrids have relatively weak interaction. This concept is reminiscent of the intrinsic termination in bacterial transcription, which we have already discussed in the previous videos. Now let's add some more details to this classic view of termination. It is important to keep in mind that RNA polymerase 3 consists of around 17 subunits. One of these subunits binds to the T-rich DNA on the unwound non-template DNA strand. Our focus will be on three specific subunits of the polymerase 3. C37 is responsible for binding the thymidine tract, allowing it to latch onto and pause the polymerase. This pausing then triggers other subunits, such as C11 or C53, to reorganize the conformations and cleave the RNA at the active site, within a paused elongation complex. So in essence, you can think of elongation complex pausing at the AU hybrid, with certain subunits of the polymerase finally then coming together to cleave the RNA and then terminate transcription. This concept of DNA latching represents a somewhat more detailed perspective on the intrinsic style termination of RNA polymerase 3. More recently, studies have revealed an intriguing aspect of RNA produced by the Paul 3. When this RNA has the potential to form secondary structure, as you may have noticed with the tRNAs, it can recruit specific proteins like SEN1 helicase. SEN1 helicase in turn can load other complex proteins onto the RNA and induce termination. This helicase-dependent termination mechanism is similar to the road-dependent mechanism in bacteria. It's important to note that the termination of Paul 3 transcription can take various forms. It doesn't have to strictly adhere to intrinsic or extrinsic mechanisms. More often than not, it involves a combination of both. As mentioned earlier, Paul 3 transcription research is still relatively unexplored. But I hope that this video provides you with a general understanding of the process. I hope it was useful, and as always, I will see you in the next video.